Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for attending this talk. And uh, namaste to all the people in India. <laughs> um, I'm Daniel Paulus, uh, Director of Engineering at uh, the company with the probably cutest logo of them all. So we like raccoons, as you can see at Checkly. And we're going to talk a little about um, how we can use Go iOS, my open source project, to run um, real device testing with Appium on Linux. Um, if you look at uh, schedule, basically, so we'll first um, briefly talk about what actually happens when you um, install an application with Xcode, like under the hood. Um, this is important to understand the rest of the talk. And I try to make it not super technical. And then uh, we'll talk about, so how is it possible that we can do this on Linux while these devices actually should only work on macOS. Um, and then the second part of the talk will be talking about um, deep proxy, but more about that later. Um, so uh, how did this whole project come to life? Um, why does somebody spend so much time on something like this? Uh, so I always enjoyed doing a little reverse engineering on the side, right? But I'm, I'm by no means a security researcher or an expert, but I, when I was a kid, I wrote some cracks and key generators and, you know, now and then I do some capture the fact puzzles. And, um, then I worked at a company called SAS Labs for over two years, which my, quite a few of you might know. And, uh, I worked there as a senior engineer and we did a lot of, uh, reverse engineering um, for iOS specifically, and also sometimes for Android to make real devices or to expose features real devices had um, to customers. And um, I basically back then started Go iOS as a fun project to learn Golang and uh, just did some, you know, copycat uh, commands from Libby mobile device, which is the other very important open source tool that you can use to control iOS devices on Linux, but it is missing one critical thing, and we'll talk about this also later. And at some point uh, after leaving Source Labs, uh, I decided to develop Go iOS into a full blown um, iOS CLI tool. Um, I also have one other project um, that allows you to do screen recording for iOS devices on Linux, similar to what QuickTime does on the Mac, but uh, we'll see this only briefly in a demo today. So um, what does Xcode actually do under the hood um, when you install something like WebDriver agent and then start testing it, right? So basically the foundation of every, every real device, Appium iOS uh, device test, um, right? So you need to start WebDriver agent. So let's look at what actually happens in detail. Um, I created this little drawing and I hope it helps to uh, understand the process uh, from a not so super technical perspective, right? So if you look at uh, what you can see is Xcode as an example for um, I Mac OS tools. And you can see a Mac and you can see an iOS device, right? And then you can see two services. The first one that is running on your local machine when you have a MacBook um, or any kind of Mac is the so-called USB Max D service, uh, which I think is short for USB multiplexing daemon. Um, and what that actually means is basically you can, can imagine this as a server that is running on your Mac all the time and awaits connections from Mac OS tools. And then the second service you can see on the iOS device is the so-called lockdown service, which is running on a predefined TCP port. Um, and again, this is really just, you can imagine this as a server, right? So nothing super complicated. And then, so let's go to the next step. So the first step of every real device interaction from macOS is always uh, a connection to uh, varun USB Max D, right? So for those of you uh, who are using Windows or are not super familiar with networking, um, on Linux and macOS, you have uh, so-called Unix domain sockets, which basically means it's a regular network connection like with a TCP port, um, but you can use a file 
name as a address, right? So on Windows, for example, I think this would be localhost 15,000 um, running on port 15,000. So every macOS tool, when it wants to interact with devices, at first connects basically to this address, um, which is like an ordinary network address, right? Um, establishes a connection to the USB multiplexing daemon. And then something interesting happens. Um, you can see that um, the USB multiplexing daemon, what it basically does is it allows you to connect to services running on iOS devices with a regular network connection, right? So there's nothing USB related. You don't have to know about USB coding or anything like that. You can really just send regular messages over a network um, and something like a TCP connection. Right, and in case of app installation, what basically happens is that uh, Xcode sends a command directly to Lockdown that says, hey, Lockdown, can you please start the application installation service? And then the Lockdown service responds and says, yeah, sure, uh, I just started it, right? And now you can see a second service uh, spawned on the phone and Lockdown tells you on which network port it started. Right, so lockdown basically says, yep, start at the service, runs on uh, 43 to one, which is a number that I completely made up. Um, so those are random ports. And now Xcode knows where the installation service is running. So the next step is uh, Xcode again, connecting to the daemon. And basically this time it says, please connect me to TCP port 43 to one. Um, and then it gets a connection, a regular network connection that is piped through to the app installation service, which is called uh, streaming zip conduit. And now Xcode is basically good to go and install its application, right? And I think this is a good example um, because it, this is basically how every interaction works, right? If you have something else running here, so not Xcode, but maybe um, the Apple configurator or the accessibility inspector or uh, any tool really that interfaces with iOS devices through the USB cable, they all go the same way, right? So they connect to the USB MaxD, they connect to Lockdown, they ask Lockdown to start a specific service that they use, Lockdown tells them the port, and then they start communicating with their service. And if you look at the summary, so streaming zip conduit is the service that Xcode uses to install applications nowadays. And if you're curious about what the actual communication looks like um, that Xcode does here. So most of the communication is using standard Apple property lists. Um, if you are not familiar with those, that is basically just a XML format that uh, contains serialized dictionaries and arrays, right? So the first thing that is sent, um, Apple sends such a property list with a command that says init transfer. And you can actually see this in, in plain text when you look at uh, what's going, going over the wire. And um, then all the individual files of your application are sent in a pretty strange zip-like format, um, but they're all uncompressed. So this is like typical Apple stuff. Uh, when I implemented this for Go iOS, basically the first thing I tried was using the native um, zip implementation that uh, Golang has. But of course, the uh, Apple zip implementation was not compatible with that. So I had to kind of write my own little custom zip format. Um, luckily, all the files are uncompressed. So it, it's not that hard actually. And interestingly, what you can see is that, of course, when you think of the Xcode progress bar, every file is basically sent individually, right? So then Xcode knows when files are sent, when the devices receive them. And once all the files are, uh, of your application are sent over to the device over this regular network connection, um, you receive another XML blob plist with installation progress, uh, right? So it actually sends you, the phone sends you back percentage values, um, how far along the installation process is going. Um, and this is what ends up in the blue progress bar in Xcode. So I think this is actually really cool to, to see this um, and, and understand what's actually going on under the hood. And once 
the install progress update with status data complete comes, um, Xcode basically knows, okay, this is done. So let's look at, uh, so what can we conclude from this? So I think it's important to understand a few things, right? Um, every tool and service interacting with iOS devices from a Mac over the USB cable basically works exactly like this. They all use different services that they start on the phone, but they all use lockdown and they all use similar protocols. And now the cool thing is um, we can figure out how these protocols work. We can implement them. Um, sometimes we can make them even more stable than the original. So I remember a specific uh, instance when we implemented gathering CPU metrics and uh, memory stats for applications. Um, the original Xcode implementation was very fragile and you could basically kill the whole service uh, if you didn't stop it before you closed Xcode. And um, when we look at how these things work in detail under the hood, we can actually make them more stable than the original sometimes. And <clears throat> of course, another conclusion is we can do all of this in Linux, right? Uh, because it's just using standard networking stuff, SSL, XML, um, some remote procedure calls. So nothing that would force us to use Mac OS. We can go ahead and do this, but of course, we need some tooling for this, right? Because doing this just like that is going to take a lot of time. So this is why I wrote uh, Go iOS. Um, it was inspired by the by mobile device, which does something similar, but is written in C. Um, and I think Go Golang is a little easier to learn and understand than C. Um, pro probably a lot of C developers are hating me right now for this comment, but <laughs> sorry. Um, and Go iOS right now is in a state where it can do most of what Libre mobile device can do, uh, but it can do more than that. Um, particularly, um, it can launch XC tests, which is important for Appium, right? Because this is what Appium for iOS real devices basically is. Um, it's using WebDriver agent, which is a wrapper around the XC um, UI test test framework. And you can launch apps with it, kill apps, and much more. And uh, before we go on, let's look at a few design considerations that I made when I implemented Go iOS. So one thing that always annoyed me hey, about... Mm -hmm. There's actually a question from Shamal Kumar Surai. So mm -hmm. the question is how to put in background and killing it from background. Uh, how to put apps into, into the background? Yeah, I think that's what he meant. There, there. Um, do you want him to explain his question? Uh, I can just say how you put apps in the background, and then if it's not that, maybe you can ask a follow up. Uh, yeah. Actually, um, I think one thing that you could do um, there is an issue on the Go iOS uh, repo also about something similar, which was about uh, waking up the device. Uh, I think one thing that you could maybe try is using um, is launching Springboard. Uh, it's a bit hacky, but I think it would work, right? So if you launch Com Apple Springboard, I guess it would go to the foreground, and then whatever app you have would go to the background. Could work, but that's the best answer I have right now. <laughs> um, but if there's a way, then we can actually find it, and we will see later in the talk how. Um, and so the, the CLI is uh, JSON first, right? For easy parsing, because this is something that always annoyed me about other tools. Uh, you have to do some weird regex string parsing to get command line output. And uh, with Go iOS, you would see that everything comes as a JSON object, which is pretty cool, especially for Node.js JavaScript developers. Um, it uses doc opt, uh, command line interface syntax. So everything comes in one command. Um, you don't have to have tons of tools lying around. It's a modular build, right? So you don't have to use the CLI if you don't want to. You can also just directly import the modules and write your own iOS web servers if you want um, to control stuff over HTTP rather than using the CLI. Uh, very fast builds. Um, it's natively compiled because written in Golang. So it's a very small set of tools that are running pretty quickly. Um, and then it comes with a powerful debug proxy tool, which we will talk about later. And last but not least, it's MIT license, 
So if you want to build cool stuff with it, like, I don't know, automated iOS device configuring Raspberry Pis, well, you can. And uh, I'm always happy to help. So I'm pretty active on my issues page um, if you have any questions. And then let's quickly look at um, what we can actually do. Um, and we'll just pick out some of the commands, right? You see that uh, there's a list command that will list devices. There's the info command, which is the equivalent to iDevice info. Um, there's an image command to mount developer images, which is a super technical thing that maybe not that interesting, right? You can grab the logs, make screenshots, and a few other things. Um, I think most notably, or one thing that I added recently, which could be pretty cool for people using Appium, it now has the command, um, I implemented this um, device state command. So if you've noticed in recent version of Xcode, the, uh, Apple introduced a way to set like three uh, simulated 2G connections or put the device into different thermal states or have degraded GPU performance and these kind of things. And Go iOS actually allows you to do this from the command line. Um, so you don't have to, I don't know, write, write some weird Apple script for Xcode or uh, do something else. You can just use Go iOS and um, also enable all these things that Xcode allows you to do. Um, and then let's talk about, so what else can we do? And the answer is everything. <laughs> uh, Go iOS includes a convenient implementation of DTX. Uh, I, I called it uh, uh, the holy grail of iOS remote procedure calls. Uh, if you don't know what all of this means, <clears throat> it's not super important. Um, and I don't think we want to talk about DTX here. I think the important takeaway is that um, DTX has been reverse engineered partially by many people and there's bits and pieces lying around on the internet. Um, but what we were missing was a uh, good implementation um, of the protocol. So you can use all the interesting iOS services, right? Because this protocol is used for launching tests, launching apps, killing apps, grabbing CPU metrics, using accessibility APIs. Um, so for all of these cool things, there was no way to do it prior. And GoIOS comes with a really nice implementation. So you don't even have to understand how the whole thing works. You can just implement your own uh, features if you want. And uh, so we did talk about containers, right? So where are the containers? Um, uh, I created a demo project to work with iOS devices in a containerized Linux environment. Um, with this one, you can easily set up your local iOS device rack on a cheap Linux box and run Appium there, right? So the cool thing is that all of this requires hardly any CPU resources or anything. So you can run like 30 devices or so on a Linux box easily. Um, we are about to watch a small demo of all of this. And if you want to follow along later or try it yourself, there is a Medium article explaining all these things in detail again. And all the source of the demo that you're about to see is also on an open source repository. So you can get all of this going yourself. And uh, if you encounter any issues, right? I mean, uh, I, I guess most of you are quality assurance, right? So you, you know the problem uh, when, when developers develop something. And uh, in my case, I know pretty well how all of this works. So it's always hard to write documentation that is understandable for people who are, uh, are not as familiar with the uh, technology as I am. So if you have any troubles getting started or if I missed some something that for me is trivial, but for someone who's not into that, it's actually a problem, just create an issue um, in GitHub and I'm super happy to help and update. But uh, yeah, now let's uh, look at the demo. So this one is pre-recorded. <clears throat> Right, so, and you can see that uh, I checked out the iOS Appium on Linux repository. And what I'm doing is building a Docker image that contains Appium and <clears throat> contains uh, Go iOS, uh, the latest release of it. So the Docker image basically downloads it, unzips it, um, and adds a script to run Appium. And all right, let's copy the container, the image ID, and just run it. Right, and all these um, scripts are contained in the repository, right? And here you can see um, 
basically, we have started Appium inside the container right now, right? So welcome to Appium 120. Um, okay, here's the container. And now let's run WebDriver Agent, the foundation of Appium real device testing. And it's for iOS. All right, I'm using Docker exec to run the command inside the container. Um, and I named the go iOS binary iOS in this case. So it's the same binary. And here you can see, right? So the command is run WDA um, and that's all you need to do. So basically go iOS uh, runs a pre-installed web driver agent on the device. Um, and you can see that all the logging output is in JSON. And you can actually see some of the method calls that uh, are usually made by Xcode, right? So go iOS has a pretty uh, generous log level and you can see a lot of the output, um, which is pretty interesting if you want to understand, you know, how does all of this testing flow actually work? And then you will see when the phone tells Xcode when something is done and sends events back and forth and all that. Um, it's actually really interesting, but, but too much stuff to go into detail right now. And you can see WebDriver agent is running, right? Awesome. So we just started WebDriver agent on Linux. Really cool. Um, no Mac OS involved. And now let's, to, to prove that Appium is actually working, <laughs> uh, I wrote a little WebDriver IO uh, test. Uh, sh shout out to, to my friend and former coworker, Christian Roman for this amazing framework. Um, as you can see, I wrote a very simple um, test that really just opens a YouTube video waits for five seconds and then opens the weather app, right? So nothing um, too fancy for this demo. Oh yeah, and then on a side note, I'm using also my uh, reverse engineered other project, the QuickTime video hack uh, to see the actual real device uh, screen on Linux, right? So this is what you could do usually with QuickTime on, um, on the Mac. And here you can just do it with uh, my tool. We actually have some more questions, Daniel. Okay. Yeah. So Shall we just uh, finish the demo demo quickly and then handle yeah. the questions. Sure. It's it's just okay. like a minute or so. Um, right. So we run it, and then you can see, right? So I ran Node.js on my local machine, and then you can see inside the Docker container, Appium is starting to create its session. Uh oops. And you can see things are happening here in WebDriver agent and suddenly boom, um, action, <laughs> uh, right? So WebDriver IO is now opening YouTube. And to prove that it's actually a real device and not something emulated, uh, you cannot see this here, but I actually tapped on the play button uh, physically. <laughs> and um, right, so it opens the weather app and we're done. Nice weather in Lyon. Okay, um, we, we can proceed to the questions. That uh, concludes the demo, basically. Okay. Yeah, so someone is asking if it is possible to use this tool on Linux to communicate with devices via network. Uh, yes, I mean, it depends on what you mean by communicating. Um, if it's about uh, using devices remotely, um, then yeah, that's totally possible. Right, so you can basically do all of these things from a remote host as well. So if, if you want to interact with devices directly over a network, that, that is totally possible. Okay. The other question is, um, does it work with uh, simulators on or only real device in Linux? Uh, it only works with real devices. Simulators uh, work a little different. Uh, they're not really... Um, devices per se, they're just uh, Mac OS applications. So porting those to Linux is uh, an entirely different story, sadly. Okay. <laughs> now the other question is, uh, will this be also supported on APM 2.x? Um, so it, it will work for sure, um, right? Because like I said, it's a WebDriver agent is and will stay the foundation of iOS real device testing for Appium indefinitely. Um, and yes, it will be supported uh, for sure. 
Okay. Um, another one. Have you modified the uh, WDA? No, it's default web driver agent, no modifications. You can, can uh, in, yep. in fact, you can run any XC test, right? So it doesn't have to be web driver agent. If you're only using XC UI test or you're using XC UI test in addition to Appium, that's also perfectly possible. I see. Someone's also asking, can you run this on mobile apps? Uh, ooh, I don't know. <laughs> I've never tried this. <laughs> Okay, what means the almost Mac freeway? Mm -hmm. So one thing that um, you cannot do on Linux is um, actually compile and package your application, right? So this is uh, beyond the scope of Go iOS because uh, yeah, Xcode basically is like super proprietary and this whole compilation and code signing process uh, usually does not make sense to reverse engineer. Um, yeah, so for that, you need, need a Mac. OK. We actually have quite a few. We have about 10 questions. Do you want to continue your um, presentation first and then get back to the questions? Yeah? Yeah, makes sense. Uh, also, I think we'll, we'll have quite some time. So um, let's see. So, yeah. so of course, one question that uh, that some of you might have is, so how can we make this future proof, right? I mean, this is reverse engineer. Doesn't that mean that every iOS release kind of breaks everything and then it doesn't work anymore? Um, kind of. Um, so with usually with every iOS release, Apple changes something, right? Um, and then you have to make some modifications or some changes to make it work. Um, so that's a bummer, but the positive thing is for once, um, that the protocols that are used underneath, um, so this whole plist, property list stuff, and um, the DTX protocol, they are relatively stable. So there have been no major, I think no, not even no major, I think there have been no changes at all since the beginning of iOS for those, um, right? So you can see it in my mobile device. They also say this um, since iOS 9, nothing has changed. So basically the only thing that you need to do is similar to using private APIs, right? So if they rename something or they refactor something, um, change the way that you need to call methods, you'll have to make these adjustments. Um, so that's good. And then what else? Uh, reverse engineering is hard, right? Uh, we don't want to decompile binaries or look at header files. It's way too complicated to do this every time. It's slow and inefficient. And really nobody wants to look at binary files. So ladies and gentlemen and dear non-binary friends, <laughs> which is the only pun I'm making in this whole presentation, uh, I present to you um, dproxy. Um, dproxy basically solves this problem for us. And to understand dproxy, let's look at uh, this image again, right? So you mind, uh, you might remember this one from before. And now, of course, someone could, could come up with this idea quite easily, right? So the thing is, if all of this is simple network communication, why don't we use something like Wireshark to just you know, check what's going on on the wire? And so with Unix domain sockets, it's not as easy as with TCP ports, but still totally doable. Um, and I did not use Wireshark. Uh, I just implemented my own tool. And so the idea is basically, as you can see, that what dproxy does under the hood is it's basically just moving var run USB max D because it is a network socket, but it's also a file. <clears throat> so you can just move it. And you can move it to somewhere else, like USB max D dot real. And then you can start your own server on var run USB max D. <clears throat> And what then, what then is going to happen, right? So Xcode, for example, it will connect to dproxy first. Um, and this gives dproxy a chance to decode all the messages into plain text um, and human readable, I mean, kind of human readable uh, formats. Uh, I understand them, but uh, <laughs> I, I hope others do as well. Um, and then dproxy basically decodes and uh, dumps everything to a file. So what you can do with it is, um, 
for example, for Xcode, right? So let's say a new iOS version comes out, uh, iOS 15, and um, running WebDriver agent doesn't work anymore. So basically what you do is you fire up deep proxy, um, you open Xcode, you run WebDriver agent, uh, you stop deep proxy, and then you look at the um, network dump that it created, and then you would see what exactly changed. That's That's the whole idea. So the cool thing about this is that with dproxy, we can implement any feature the Mac has, right? So regardless of what it is, if a macOS tool can do it um, using the USB cable, then we can figure out how it works and we can implement our own. <clears throat> it allows us to quickly check and debug new iOS updates, which is nice. And then uh, if somebody wants, you know, you can even build cool products on top of it. Uh, so because, as dproxy basically is able to decode and re-encode things on the fly. Um, you can optimize protocols for remote use if you want, or you can filter stuff, modify things, right? So if you wanted, you could even filter the iOS device logs with it. And uh, like the end user wouldn't even know, right? So you would basically have a tool that transparently for Xcode and anyone else filters the logs or I don't know, prevent pairing the device. Uh, if if you have a few people using it remotely and you don't want them to pair it, uh, which can be a problem sometimes. <clears throat> and yeah, um, basically that. And okay, now let's see if this actually works. Let's quickly look at... Uh, Short demo of the proxy. All right, so um, okay, cool. You can see that uh, a device is connected to my machine. In this case, an iPhone XR. Um, and like I said, right, so you see the nice JSON output. You don't have to do any parsing. It's perfectly valid um, JSON. And so now let's run go iOS deep proxy. Okay, and then let's hope it works. Oops. Okay, so I wanted to run one. Uh, I wanted to start WebDriver agent on the device, and then you can see uh, I, I made an effort to give actually meaningful um, error messages, right? So it says, have you mounted the developer image? Um, that is something that Xcode usually does automatically, but since we don't have any Xcode on Linux, and I mean, I'm running this on a Mac, right? It also works perfectly fine on a Mac, by the way. Uh, but Go iOS comes with a tool that uh, automatically downloads and installs developer images. So now we have the device ready. Let's try and run with Drive Agent. And here we go. Um, WebDriver agent runs. I could now start an Appium session if I wanted. Um, right, again, this will work on Linux and it will also work on Windows, um, but I'm just using my Mac for convenience. Um, and now here's the deep proxy output, right? So the cool thing is deep proxy was running in the background the whole time and it dumped like some pretty interesting information to the console, right? So you could actually see uh, here, which information was being sent back and forth. And uh, here, for example, you can see uh, the WebDriver agent invocation, right? So for example, here you can see uh, the device usually calls XCT log debug message on, on Xcode, right? So it basically tells Xcode to invoke this function um, in Objective-C which has a string as a parameter, which is the log message, right? So this is how logging works for XC testing. And um, yeah, so you can basically see all the raw output. And now if you stop the proxy, right? Like I said before, so maybe make this a bit bigger, right? So it's moving back um, the original socket. Um, and now, the device should work just as well as it did before. Nice. And what we can see is that dproxy created a dump um, directory. 
And this one contains uh, all the connections that were created um, during the time that Deproxy was running. And now we could basically go into one of those and actually check out what happened, right? So we're not going to go into too much detail about this, but you can basically see all the messages that were sent and received uh, by Deproxy. And I just have two more slides and then we can go to the Q and A. Um, so special thanks goes out to my sponsors. Uh, first of all, David Harkowski, who's also giving a talk about his uh, cool project Control Floor. Um, thanks a lot, David, for your support and, um, and sponsoring. Um, second sponsor is Sitespeed.io. Um, thanks, you, thanks you all for sponsoring the project. Uh, really happy and, and grateful for this. And then Nikola Shabanov, thank you also for sponsoring the project. Uh, really, really kind of you, and I appreciate it a lot. Um, now, thanks for this. Uh, thanks for listening. Uh, I hope you found the talk interesting. Um, now is the time to ask me more stuff, and of course, I will shamelessly do some advertising for my company, Checkly. <laughs> uh, it lets you combine your end-to-end -end testing skills with production monitoring, which I think is pretty cool. Um, and if you want to try it, go to check.new and see how fast you can set up an end-to-end -end test that you could use for production monitoring. Um, that's it. Awesome. Thank you so much, Daniel. So um, I think we'll try to answer as many questions as we can right now. So we have 14 questions right now. And uh, the question that is asked, is there any similar to any similar to GStreamer for Mac CLI? <sighs> Uh, 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 G streamer. I'm a bit lost. What, what, what's the question exactly about? Can I see it somewhere? Is, uh, do we have it in the chat? Yeah, we do have it in the Q and A section. Ah, okay. Let Let me open open yeah. Uh, so I mean FFmpeg, right? Um. So G streamer is what I'm using for a QuickTime video hack. Um. Um, I like GStreamer. It's a cool open source uh, video transcoding platform. Um, but yeah, you can also use FFmpeg. So the oh, next question is, can you use it also for simulators? Yep. So partially, yes. Uh, interesting. Uh, what's interesting is that for running um, XUI test and starting WebDriver agent, you can actually use it um, so it will work because interestingly, um, simulators expose a socket that lets you directly talk to the same service that real devices use for running tests. So you can make it work for simulators as well. Actually, that's how, um, that's how I first uh, developed all of this. Uh, so I figured out that simulators have that. And so it was a little easier to get uh, raw um, information and debug the DTX protocol and figure it out. So, yeah, the only downside is, of course, that you cannot actually run IO simulators on Linux unless you have some virtualization. All right. Um, so the next one is, is this one legal? Since I'm not sure if Apple will be happy on this one. Mm -hmm. So, um, I think it depends on which country you're in. Uh, so for Germany, since I'm not having any like financial gain from this, I think it's okay. Uh, should, should be covered by German laws, regardless of what Apple's uh, weird licenses say. Um, as you can at least here reverse engineer anything just for educational purposes and then make it freely av available. Uh, about Apple, I think they actually don't care. Uh, so Apple usually they they don't care about all of these you know small projects because you cannot jailbreak a device with it, right? So it doesn't really matter to them, and the use case is so small. Um, and and Apple is like a mainly consumer oriented uh, company, right? So unless you buy iPhones from them in the millions, they don't care about you actually. <laughs> so I don't think they will notice. Okay, thank you. Um, so how can we read iOS device logs? Mm -hmm. um, so you can run, um, maybe I can just show it. Let me share again quickly. And 
right. Is this the right? Yeah. So all it takes is go iOS syslog. What? Oh. Right. And now you can get logs. And they're also in JSON format again, right? So, I mean, it's like you cannot really stream JSON, right? So I cannot send an array. So you have to do some, uh, at least uh, check the line breaks. But still, it's it's perfectly valid JSON. So easy to consume. So yeah, syslog is the command. Yeah, another one. Just to clarify, is it possible to interact with the device or only see what is happening? It's possible to interact with the device, right? So you can basically do anything that macOS uh, based software can do with a device, right? Like, like Xcode is able to run a test and install an application. You can do this with Go iOS. Um, you can pair the device. Uh, I recently added uh, a feature that lets you even pair with the device without this annoying uh, trust pop-up. Um, so this is especially cool for remote use cases, right? Where nobody is there to tap on the device. Um, you can actually pair the device without any human interaction, which is quite nice. Um, and yeah, so yeah, you interact with the device. So it's... Can we do parallel execution with multiple physical devices? Yep. How can we read iOS device logs? Okay, we had that. <laughs> it's uh, iOS syslog. Um, how does this work with signing stuff? Yeah, yeah, signing is an interesting uh, use case. So we thought about reverse engineering code signing. Um, the thing is, you can totally do this. Uh, but we figured back then that it's probably not worth the effort because um, you, what we what we ended up doing is um, just wrap the code sign command with the HTTP server and then you know use it use like one Mac or some you can even you, you can even use GitHub uh, actions right I actually thought about writing a little demo about how to use GitHub actions to code sign your application um, something like this is what I would do because usually you don't sign these applications a lot, right? Um, and if you sign them, um, you already have a Mac because you also need to build and package the application. So what I would say makes more sense is to just use a Mac for signing and um, not, not be concerned with that. Uh, but yeah, I mean, if you want reverse engineering code signing is totally possible. And there is an old Sauce Labs project where they did it. Um, but it's it's not maintained anymore. So yeah, there's some prior work, but right. Um, so can we do continuous integration with this setup? Yep, you can do that. Yeah. How does um, Go iOS keep it its keep itself updated with the latest Xcode? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, right now I do this, right? So I have some GitHub sponsors um, um, and I just uh, regularly check um, new devices. For example, the iPhone XR that I was using um, is on the iOS 15 beta, right? So it's uh, pretty new. So I just make sure that the latest version works. Um, I usually don't support uh, actively like older versions. So if you want to run it on iOS 9, it might be that it doesn't work anymore. I mean, it's totally doable to add support, but right now it's not a focus that I have. Okay. I think we'll answer one last question and then we all can move on to the Hangout session. So the last one for this session is, can APM server run on Dr. Host A and the emulator and simulated devices run on Mac host B? Yeah, uh, that should work. Yeah? Okay, I think we can have one more question. <laughs> we still have time. Can you use Go iOS to get performance metrics of the device? Um, in theory, you can do that. Uh, 
I just haven't implemented it. Um, there was so far nobody was asking for it. So if it's an interesting use case for you, uh, just add a GitHub issue and like this should take around like, I don't know, maybe one or two hours to implement. So it's not a crazy effort, um, right? Basically all I do is fire up dproxy, um, record CPU metrics, write down all the method invocations and then they re-implement them with GoIOS. So it's, uh, yeah. All right, okay. So I think that brings us to the end of the session. And thank you so much guys for joining in and thank you so much, Daniel, for the great session. I think we can see a lot of like great reviews on the chat of how much they think it's really helpful, your session.